and I will also start to record the broadcasting. All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this uh, talk today. My name is Matthias Persson, and I have also a friend with me. Yes, uh, my name is Helena Weigel. And, and we, both Matthias and I, we, we are, uh, Matthias is the chairman and I am secretary of the, the local social democratic association Triangen in Malmö. And we have joined here to, this evening to talk about the shift and we have two special guests with us and you can start to, to say hello. All yes. right. Welcome, warm welcome Leilani Farha from Canada. We're so happy and grateful that you could join us today. Thank you so much. I'm very pleased to be here and to see Mayor Katrine. I haven't seen you in some time. It's really lovely. Um, I think this conversation is super important. There's so much going on right now. So I think we probably have a lot to talk about. Yes, and then we should introduce uh, Katrin schoenfeldt Janne as well, uh, the mayor of Malmö. Warm welcome, Katrin. Thank you very meeting. much. Thank you very much for the invitation, the initiative, and thank you very much, Lailani, uh, for accepting the invitation. I, I'm really happy to, to meeting with you again. It's quite a long time now. And I also want to say very, very welcome to all in the audience here. We are 45 persons in this Zoom meeting and we will start to hear more about uh, the shift uh, from Katrine and from Lailani. But then afterwards, everyone is uh, invited to, to ask questions. So yeah, how do we start, Elena? Do we have a... Uh, we start to ask uh, Lailene about the project. Yes, uh, I don't know if we should uh, talk a little about the rules first and the arrangement of this seminar. Yeah, we, we um, could say something. May I just uh, stop? We are not live on Facebook. All yep. right. Mm. Then we record it right now on my computer and I will put it up later. Okay. Or I will try to fix it also uh, now, but uh, we continue with the interview. Okay. But uh, Matthias, can you tell us something about the rules of this meeting? Yeah, the, the, the rules is if you want to ask a question, then uh, you start to write in the chat. Uh, and then we will, uh, when we have the question session, we will uh, ask you to put on your uh, camera and we also want you to have your full name and then you can ask the question. And everyone is going to be recorded. So I hope it's okay for you that we will broadcast it and put it on social media afterwards also. All right. Good. So we, we will start by uh, Leilani and Katrine talking about uh, the shift. Um, and then uh, after about half an hour, we open the meeting to ask questions to Leilani and Katrin. So first, uh, Leilani Farha, you are the global director of the shift. Can you give us an introduction and a background story? Why did you start the shift? Sure. Um, and again, thanks so much for inviting me. And uh to talk about the shift in particular and i think we are at a particular time now when the shift is in incredibly relevant or the need for the shift um so many of you may know i was the united nations special rapporteur on the right to housing uh, i finished my tenure at the end of april when i came into that position in 2014 six years ago it was really obvious to me immediately when i looked 
around globally that there was a global housing crisis. There was no question. Every city in the global north and the global south was suffering uh, unaffordable rents, uh, large numbers of homeless people, in some places people being evicted from their homes um, for foreclosure on rent and that sort of thing you saw in southern Europe, for example, uh, was still going on. And, you know, we were well past the global financial crisis technically, which was in 08. Um, but it was clear to me that there was this global housing crisis. And then it became clear to me that there were global housing actors and that the landscape of housing had really changed significantly since 2008. And the landscape had changed away, really away from housing being about home or a place for families to grow or where people can be safe and secure and contribute to their communities. And it had become spec a speculative uh, commodity. And so with these two global things happening, a global housing crisis and global actors, I felt we needed a global response. And as rapporteur, I mean, I was a global response, but just one person. And one person cannot address these massive and significant issues. And these big actors who have a the actors I'm talking about are financial actors with a lot of not just money and capital, but political uh, power. And so I felt it was important that we form some kind of a global response. And so the shift was born. I looked for partners. I wanted partners in this, obviously, as I said, it's not for one person to do. And I felt the partners that I ended up with were the appropriate ones because one partner is the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights. And if we're going to challenge the commodification of housing, we need another framework. And I believe strongly the correct framework and the only framework that, will, that has the possibility of challenging this idea is the human rights framework. So the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights was a natural partner. And then I also knew that it's cities and city governments that are really at the front line of the housing crisis, really dealing with it in, in remarkable ways, in creative ways, but also suffering the crisis. And so to have cities as my partners in this shift seemed really important. And so we formed through a network of cities called UCLG, United Cities and Local Governments, and the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights and myself, we formed the shift. And the real goal is to, to push all levels of government to recommit to housing as a human right, to challenge the commodification of housing, um, and to do the work that's necessary in that regard. And there's a lot of a lot of activities that have to happen to make that to make to make that shift. Uh, and so that's what being involved in the shift is about. It's not about already being a human rights. Um, uh, being expert at human rights, many of the partners in the shift don't, and, and members of the shift are not already excelling in the area of human rights, but they know that that's where they want to go. Yeah. Thank you, Leilani. Um, Katrin, um, what was the reason uh, that Malmö signed the shift? Can you give us uh, some background story to that? Uh, of course. Uh, I would, first of all, I would like to say that uh, I had the opportunity to, uh, through uh, Fredrik Gatten, the filmmaker. Uh, I saw you here earlier, Fredrik. Maybe you could say hi. I think okay. he's everyone sees you. I, I, no, I just unmuted myself because I was eating a sandwich. I didn't want to have it out in the air. But hello, okay, everybody. Sorry, I'm, listening. I'm listening. <laughs> now, but first of all, I would say that you invited uh, us to have a meeting with Lailani when Lailani came to Malmö when you were move, uh, uh, working with your movie, uh, Push. And at that time, we were really starting to address uh, the question about how to create, in all sense, a more sustainable city. Uh, we have a long history of working 
with like green solutions, climate solutions, uh, try to build new city district and develop the city with a focus on sustainability. And I think we have lots of knowledge uh, according to how to create green sustainable city districts. But we realize that we have to address the issue about housing, how to create an inclusive city, how to, to, to work with the sustainability in all senses in the same manner as we have been doing for quite a while, according to the green issues. Um, and at that time, I had the opportunity to meet you, Lailani, and we were very inspired and I really enjoyed to have this conversation about mega trends and uh, also to discuss what's possible to do on the local level, but also which kind of issues we have to address on the national level. And just as a background, I can say when, when I started out as a mayor, I was part of uh, when we have this Paris Agreement in, uh, just a few days before all the nations decided to 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 uh, agree on the agreement or uh, uh, sign to the agreement, we were about thousand mayors in Paris, and even though we didn't know whether it was about to be this uh, national agreements or agreement between the nations, we decided to do our very best to work with, uh, to, to create uh, social sustainable cities and to be driving forces. And I felt such a power when we have those local leaders from all over the world with, even if we don't have all the tools, we do have quite a lot of power and if we share experiences and best practice, we could be quite powerful. And I felt that so, so strong in Paris at that time. And then since we tried to address the social sustainability in the same way, I have lots of meeting with, with mayors from all over the world. And I realized that we, the last years, we have been addressing the issue. It's a growing issue worldwide that mayor groups, growing groups, find it difficult to afford a living, a sustainable living within the cities. And we see that it's much easier if you have a lot of money and if you have a lower income or if you're out an income, uh, you have a very poor situation. And I think it's a growing problem worldwide. Then we have to address this issue in different ways within different cities, within different nations, with different legislation, but some megatrends is the same. So we decided to work in a different way uh, to address um, the inequalities according to housing in a more, more offensive way. Uh, so when I met you, I found one new platform to do so. And I think it's, it's, uh, uh, it's one of our most important issues uh, in Malmö, a fast growing city, a really fast growing young city uh, with lots of people with low incomes. We have to, to deal with this question and we have to be a force that are actually pushing our uh, national government, but also try to find new tools together with, with local actors, the civic society, but also the private sector that, that the parts that are, are willing to, to put lots of effort and, 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 and to invest in a long-term way. It's important. Thank you, Catherine. Um, okay. So, um, to both of you, uh, during this year, can you see uh, some some concrete achievements that has been made? Have we made any progress with the shift? What, you, you, start, Lani? you want me to go first? <laughs> um, <clears throat> yeah, it's actually been pretty remarkable uh, to me because change we know takes a long time and any kind of change, structural change takes an exceptionally long time normally. And yet uh, I've been, super surprised by how quickly um, I feel things are changing at the local level and at the national level even. Um, 
And I will say, I do believe that uh, the film Push has had a significant impact in that way um, because it's allowed us to have a global conversation about issues that people actually don't know a lot about or are afraid to talk about. So tenants often feel that they're alone in their situation, in their not being able to afford the rent, they're often embarrassed. They feel that they've failed somehow in society. Uh, and the film push has enabled tenants to realize, oh, wait a second, I'm actually um, the victim of a system. And um, that then enables a conversation. A lot of people don't actually know why housing is so expensive or why there's homelessness in cities or, you know, what, and the film really enabled us to, to, to inform people about that. So I think through that, it, um, through the film, we, we, as well as obviously advocacy and, and the, the sense that cities have, that Katrine just said, you know, we're, there was, there's a strong sense I find amongst mayors that we're on an unsustainable path, that things, it's not possible to continue. Things are, the cost of housing is just escalating and escalating. And then the people who run cities, who make cities work, can't actually afford to live there. And so I think all of this was coming together when the shift formed. Um, some examples, um, I was, at, and this is a neighbor of yours, so, uh, uh, you may be interested, but for example, at the national level in Denmark, um, so, you know, the film um, Push had its uh, world premiere in Copenhagen um, just over a year ago, and um, there it created a buzz that was already happening to some degree on the local level. Blackstone, one of the largest, uh, well, the largest private equity firm, had been purchasing uh, housing in uh, Copenhagen in one particular neighborhood and quite a few houses. And there was real pushback because people were not able to afford the rents. Um, and uh, Copenhagen joined the shift. And there were elections in Denmark that were, I think, marked by the housing issue. And the new national government um, very recently adopted very progressive law to try to create an atmosphere that would be um, protective of tenants and tenants' rights uh, and would be uh, more difficult for the big investors to come in and make only short-term investments. Um, so they, they created a rent freeze um, um, for tenants, which is not the kind of environment the big investors want because a rent freeze means you can't raise rents uh, quickly over a few years. Um, and there were other protections there. Um, in Canada, where I live, the national level government um, has adopted uh, fairly recently, uh, just under a year ago, um, national legislation which for the first time recognizes housing as a human right and says that it is the government of Canada's housing policy to recognize housing as a human right um, as it's articulated in international human rights law. This is a government who for many, many years uh, would not recognize housing as a human right at all. And now they have it in legislation and they've incorporated it into a national housing strategy. Um, so they're using a human rights based approach. Um, we've seen in Berlin um, tenants taking to the streets and as a result of their advocacy efforts. And I've been pleased to see a shift even in their own advocacy because when they were first you know, really challenging the big financial actors from buying up properties in Berlin and raising rents. They weren't using human rights language, and now they've they've reiter they've rearticulated their demands through human rights, um, and they have been successful so far in getting a rent freeze as well, a very substantial rent freeze. Um, there are examples out of Spain as well, similar in nature, challenging the same actors. So. There's been quite a bit of progress. Um, I will say as well in terms of um, cities involved in the shift, more than 40 mayors have committed uh, in various ways and are at different stages, of course, of commitment, which is what we expect. Um, as I said, you know, change does take time and I've been heartened to see there's an energy around the idea of um, challenging the status quo and not just accepting it. And everyone knows it's not easy to do that. Um, but 
cities and and the 40 plus cities that are involved some are you know really big cities london and paris uh as well as of course uh smaller cities montevideo for example but um there is this energy around okay we can as Katrine said, there is power. Cities do have power and they can be creative to challenge what's happening. Mm. Thank you. Um, yeah, I've, um, we will come back to some things you said because there are a lot of questions, but we can first let Kathleen in. And can you tell us something about uh, uh, what has happened during this year? In Malmö. I would say a lot of things have happened, uh, both locally, but also on the global level. And I still feel that we have a growing uh, movement uh, of local engagement. And um, well, first of all, it, it, it didn't really happen yet, but next year we will have a global world congress uh, taking place in Malmö. We are part of a network, ICLE. Uh, it's a network of 1,700 cities, uh, global network, and they will have their uh, global congress in Malmö next year. And we are working at the moment to make, uh, to address housing, adequate housing as one major uh, issue to address and discuss during those days. It's kind of a new perspective. Normally we talk about green solutions and I would, we would like to find out different way of talking about green solutions and social sustainable solutions uh, with a special focus on affordable housing and housing as uh, human rights. And I really, really look forward and I feel quite strong support to discuss this more specific next year. Uh, and I think it could make uh, an even bigger change or, or use that engagement in, in an even more offensive way. So I look forward to that and it's something we do um, prepare during this year. But then at the local level I would say that Malmö is, as I said before, a very fast growing city uh, and we have been growing this year with lots of new um, businesses, uh, workplaces, uh, schools, preschools, but luckily also lots of new apartments. Uh, to be more precise, we had 3,400 new apartments last year, and more than uh, 2,000 new apartments were just started last year, uh, to be built last year. Uh, and I would say that this is really important that we have a growing amount of numbers of new apartments, uh, even though some of them are too far too expensive for everyone to, to, to actually move into or be able to, to live in. Uh, but it's important anyway. But I'm glad that we have uh, found some strategies to make sure that it's not just in the western part, more western part and more wealthier part of the city. We also see that we have a growing number of apartments being produced in, in different areas where you haven't had this kind of investment for several years or decades, to be honest. Uh, and we also have some, some uh, projects that, uh, where older apartments are being refurbed in a quite sustainable way, not in a way that are just raising the rents, but also to, to create like um, uh, more energy efficient, but also in a social sustainable way, creating more job opportunities for, for the tenants in the surroundings. So we have lots of different projects and uh, the municipality itself has also started out uh, some different cooperation with the different actors, for example, one with the, uh, the tenant association to create uh, processes that presses down the cost for new apartments and we have a special focus on uh, apartments for young people and we try to work with the processes uh, and, and are part of it but also try to to create some kind of commitment from different actors that actually are uh, has to be parts of the change to be honest it's it's not a question for one or two actors we need to create areas where we discuss and try to to find new solutions together um, and we also started out uh, different uh, 
planning projects. Uh, uh, for example, one uh, Amiral Stadem, uh, where we plan, it's a part of uh, Riosengard, where we plan to, to build a couple of thousand new apartments uh, for a couple of years. It's closely connected to our new train station, for example. Uh, that we know for sure that infrastructure is one smart way uh, of planning the city to create like uh, sustainable transportation solutions, but it also uh, a way to to start uh, processes to have new apartments in different areas. So we have lots of different uh, projects and work. Uh, that has been started and I feel quite a strong support from, from, from different actors, both private actors, uh, which I prefer to work with that has been like long term committed uh, for the city and the city development, uh, not just uh, with a strong focus on their own apartments and buildings, but also in the surroundings uh, to create good living conditions. And uh, I would say that we have uh, good cooperation with the tenant association, which I think it's an important voice when it comes to this kind of issues. Mm. Well, thank you both for talking about um, how it is now and what, is, what has happened during the last year. Matthias? Yeah, we are open if uh, someone have a question, and I know that we have one person here, uh, Fredrik Garten, who have announced that he has a question. And uh, I don't know if you're here with us right mm -hmm. now. He's there. But you know, <clears throat> I'm a troublemaker, so you really want me on that this early? <laughs> yes, for, please, for. make some trouble. Yeah, you're in good company, I think. Yeah. No, I think it's, I'm, I'm, no, I'm, I'm, you know, I've been traveling the world, uh, talking about the film a lot, sometimes together with Leilani, a lot for myself and also around Sweden. And, and everywhere I mentioned that Malmo is a part of this and I'm really happy and proud that Malmo is a part of the shift. But of course, a lot of people also ask me, okay, so what happens now? So, it's, of course, we are a little bit waiting for that. And I understand politics is not, nothing that happens over, overnight. So it's like a, it's a longer process. Uh, I, I, I have several things. But one thing, for example, Leilani's last week as a special rapporteur, uh, she filed a communication towards a, a company based on Bahamas and Cyprus. But the, the company is called Achelius which is like now also extremely big in Malmo, both here around where I live, but also they bought Krumprins and so on. And all the stories I hear from tenants and from architects involved or from even construction workers involved, they say this, that what's happening is extremely poor quality. And so it's, it's a bit scary that we have such a big landlord and I understand it's not the city's policies to regulate them, but it's something to look look at. We also have another company which have its seat in Malmo, that's Heimstaden. And Heimstaden is, you know, it's owned by a Norwegian uh, finance guy. Um, when we were now in the Czech Republic, that was the last showing we had before the, the virus hit the world. So we were in Prague together. And we did some simple research online and checked asked people if they knew that if Blackstone was in, in, in the Czech Republic and nobody thought so. And we, we found out that they actually had 40,000, 44,000 apartments that they bought from the coal miners uh, company, one, you know, so it really poor people's homes. But now, just some days before, uh, Heimstad and based in Malmö bought 44,000 apartments from Blackstone in the Czech Republic. So we, it's good to understand what happened in Malmo. It looks like they're local people, but we have global capital operating in Malmo. And they are, their business models that they are applying in Malmo are totally global. And this is like, when I talk to people around in town, they are affected by, by, by the behavior of these guys. And of course, they are obeying the law, 
but they're also pushing the law. And we know that the former government, the, the conservative government, Aliansen, they took some legislation that weakened uh, the strength of the tenant association. So we are in a new situation, of course, and, and in one way, I wish the city to speak out a little bit more about these, uh, these big actors. I can also mention when I'm, I have this, the voice here, I saw in the newspaper this week uh, that there is a, a house coming up in, on Nobelwagen, uh, 450 units uh, and 18 square meter big apartments. That building, the, the, the landlord, the, the project people are, it's a company called Aberdeen and based in the UK, but, but it's a real estate investment trust. And these RITs, we have met, we, seen them, we see them all over the world. They, they are the guys behind the ghost towns in London or in Berlin or in New York or in Toronto. Toronto, Canada has a lot of these it's basically buildings, the projects are out on the financial markets. And I guess, guess this Aberdeen, they're building these houses all over the world. So the investors have no clue that they're actually buying into Malmo. Mm. So it's, it's, it's a totally uh, a financial product with no heart for Malmo, no care for Malmo. And I, if I was in the city and if I could stop this, I would do it now because you're, you're, you're building slum and it will okay, have uh, what's coming after. That was my quick question. Yes, uh, Fredrik, shall we give Katrin yeah, uh, the chance to answer? Yeah, no, there was there a were lot. many questions. A lot. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay, I would love to comment because I think you pinpoint uh, some really, really important issues. And you also pinpoint why it's so important that we work cities to cities cross borders because the, the problem that we have to deal with is uh, part of a global uh, movement, it's a global market, it's a global capital. And that's why I also stress when I talk that I, I really feel that we have to bring strong cooperation with actors that for real would like to make long-term commitments within the city. It's not just about the number of apartments. It's also about that landlords are able to create good living conditions and safe and, and surroundings. And it's so much more than just the apartment itself. So that's why I, I always stress that we would like to find new co uh, cooperation with actors that are not like short term driven, but long term focused. And it's a really complex uh, global network of capital and it's not always easy to follow the money. Uh, and I think some part of, of, of uh, George job, both with the film and, and George job uh, within the shift, it's important to, to, to show the problem and show the capital and and the engagement that both uh, good examples and bad examples i would say and then you pinpointed also that uh, earlier governments weaken the 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 power of uh, the tenant association for example but the fact is also that they took some really important tools from the local municipalities um, uh, earlier, it was a bit easier for us to to uh, avoid bad businesses, or that some apartments uh, were being sold out to to companies with with uh, like a very short term term focus. Uh, we don't really have that uh, tool today any longer, unfortunately. Um, so some of the solution is to, to uh, gain the pressure for uh, a na the national political parties. And I would stress parties because I think it's really important that you build broad alliances to create long-term uh, stable solutions for this kind of problems. In Malmö, we tried uh, to, 
to put together uh, some kind of advisory board with different actors from the civil society, the academia, uh, the private sector with pinpointed actors uh, to create, um, what to call it, strategies and uh, uh, well, it, it, it was a way of asking for, uh, for initiatives and solutions, on, both on the local level, but also to pinpoint what we do have to address at the national level. Uh, unfortunately, we couldn't have this uh, board all set because we had an opposition from both the left party, the conservative party, and the more uh, populist right party. They uh, joined and uh, said stop. And we have to find new solutions to, to make sure that we use the power and the engagement of different actors. I know for sure that all different parties do have their solutions and suggestions, but since we don't have those broader coalitions, nothing is being done at the moment. It's like everyone is so stuck in their own solution, uh, which means like nothing happens. So I think as a local mayor, I would like to even if it means that I have to discuss and uh, cooperate and, and uh, maybe buy some other parties' solutions in one way to find, to find uh, sustainability and, 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 and have one way out of this very closed situation where nothing actually is happening. I think the, the example from Denmark is really interesting uh, for our government to look at when it comes to, to, to make sure that the rent is not raised too, too fast and so on. So can I, can I jump in? Join the yeah. 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 Yeah, can I jump in? Yeah. Uh, I had occasion to meet with um, the minister in Sweden responsible for housing and uh, was quite interesting in that I, I didn't get the feeling he was that interested in a Denmark type legislation because there was some denial about uh, what you and Frederick described as the global capital that is infiltrating Sweden. There was a denial that that was a problem. So you have some work cut out for yourselves in terms of convincing national level government that this is a real live issue. Mm. Um, but I just, I wanted to say a couple of other things um, as well, if I might. Um, one of the things that you raised, Katrine, that I thought was very important and it, it, it goes to some of the points that Frederick was raising as well, I think, is you mentioned that there are, in fact, in Malmö, some um, housing providers who are willing to do upgrades to buildings and refurbish buildings, but from a more socially conscious place. And I, I know that to be the case in other cities as well, that there, that, that there are some who understand that refurbishment is not about capital gain, um, only <laughs> or exclusively, but that it is about creating, that they want to be involved in creating better living conditions generally for the city in which they're acting. And I think that that's, um, I think it's really important to engage those actors. And a, a lot of people have to ask me about the shift and about myself, whether I'm anti-capitalism and anti-private actors. And it's not the case at all. I think there are some private actors out there who understand that we, we shouldn't be in this mode of uber capitalism, that there is another kind of capitalism that's kinder and more gentle, <laughs> and that this capitalism on steroids is, is inappropriate and vulgar, actually. I believe there are actors out there like that. And I actually think some, that we should be looking for some young companies and young actors who have grown up in a different era with an understanding of the climate crisis um, and the social and housing crisis that is existing in most cities and that there must be some young scrappy um, uh, businesses out there entrepreneurs who might like to be engaged in housing in a more meaningful way and not uh, just to uh, get profits 
one of the things that I've been encouraging cities to do, and I'm, I, I won't put you on the spot now, Katrine, but maybe we can have this conversation later, um, is encouraging cities to adopt their own human rights-based housing strategies or, or even a charter. And even though in different jurisdictions, cities actually can't, some cities can't make law and can't designate all the housing policies they would like to, it could create an atmosphere and an understanding of the principles that you're working on as a, from, the principles you're working from as a city. So some of the principles might be, um, you know, that we, we believe in, in public assets and not selling off public assets. That could be, a, that's the human rights principle, it's a, and it could be a principle. It, you could have as a principle uh, addressing inequalities through housing. It, you could have as a principle um, uh, making a priority of addressing homelessness and ensuring no policy contributes to homelessness. You know, in creating that kind of charter or strategy, you're at least conveying to the actors in the housing sector what they can expect when they engage the city of Malma in housing. And it's not to say that you have at your fingertips the laws, because I know national government sets some of the laws and that um, you have to then negotiate with national government and try to push them, but only to say you, you then create a human rights climate in your own city. Um, and that can be quite persuasive. And when you start engaging with other cities, this is the hope of the shift, when we have a lot of cities saying, our values are human rights values at the city level with respect to housing. When many cities line up that way, I think that will put pressure on national level government. Um, and I'm gonna throw out a question or a, a provocative thing, um, because I have heard recently, and I guess it's your national level government, that for new buildings in, in Sweden, new builds, that they won't be, the rents won't be negotiated with the tenants union, that they will be set based on market, market value. And that strikes me as alarming. I think the Swedish system is so unique. And um, I think the, the separation of rents from markets, I know rents are still expensive. And of course the market has a pressure on the tenants union and those negotiations. I understand that, but still your system is very unique and quite precious. And when I heard that this might happen or has happened, I'm not sure, I find it very alarming. I'm interested to know what you think about that, Katrina, and how you're interacting with that. Yeah, uh, we have to uh, let Katrina answer that question, of course, because I think we are all interested. Uh, but, then, but then after that, I think we have to, to let the, our participants in to ask questions. I already have two questions or three questions uh, in the chat room and one raised hand at least. So first, Katrin, can you please answer that? Firstly, I would say that uh, I think the problem, according to global capital and short-term investment, is a in quite late and increasing problem. Uh, I think a couple of years ago, we didn't have the situation where we have any global capital interested <laughs> to invest in Malmö at all. Uh, we had a totally different situation just a couple of years ago. Uh, and I think as we can see that it's more getting more and more popular to, to live in Malmö and to invest in Malmö, I, I feel that it's an increasing problem that we have to address in a different way. Uh, and maybe that's uh, the opinion from the government as well, uh, that we have lots of different problems according to, to the housing markets. And this is not the major problem at the moment, but it's absolutely an increasing problem. Uh, so I think it's interesting to follow the Danish uh, initiatives. And then you have to look at it and see how it fits with the legislation in Sweden. Uh, and I know for sure that I think 
we have to have several changes in this legislation and the support system to create affordable housing, but also to support individu individuals uh, that do have low incomes, but still have the rights of a proper house to live in. Uh, so that's that's one part of uh, of the answer. The other one, according to to uh, the discussion on the national level, uh, I would underline that I think it's the Swedish model where you have the negotiation with between the tenant association and the the, the landlords. I think that's the best model uh, so far. Uh, and it's it is true that it's part of a, of an agreement at the national level to look for different solution in that direction to to create more of uh, a market driven solution for for new apartments. Uh, I would say that it's not my parties, the social democratic parties. Uh, uh, way of dealing with the situation in in, uh, in the first place uh, and at this moment we don't know uh, anything about the, the, the uh, uh, what's coming up on the table uh, uh, but it's part of the negotiation to just to be able to form a government uh, in the first place and I think most of you remember that it took like several weeks and months to form this government and I think uh, the alternative in my perspective would be much much wor worse but hopefully uh, we will see a solution that is uh, uh, well possible to live with and maybe other solutions that uh, make some solutions to, to, to other problems that we deal with well some kind of diplomatic answer, I would say. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now we have a, a couple of uh, people here who uh, uh, have asked questions in the chat. And we have uh, Pia. Uh, I don't know if you can uh, unmute your speaker your microphone Pia and ask the question it's uh, yeah. Pia. Can you hear me yes hello I'm Pia Oranil uh, I have a question for Katarina uh, do you have any power to act and stop uh, companies like Blackstones to buy and keep buildings and houses here in Malmö has the political organization any power to say like we are not interested we we would like to look at some other invest people. Uh, well, we have a national legislation uh, and we used to have more power and uh, more to say when it comes to this kind of issues before than we have today. Uh, but when it comes to our own land, when it comes to our own uh, uh, the part that we own ourselves, of course, we can can create uh, cooperation with different kind of actors. But we have a le legislation that it's it's uh, national that gives some restrictions. I would say so it's not that easily uh, easy that we own the problem or the solutions at the local level. Okay, thank you. I mean, lots of businesses are also being done between different. Uh, private actors uh, so it's not that we have a say in all those different kind of business projects hmm. okay thank you all right thank you pia for the question and we also have two uh friends here that have been raising their hands and the first person is abebe uh, and then we have johanna saunders abebe please Thank you. Uh, good evening, ladies and, uh, and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Ababa. I have a question for Lalaina and uh, Katarina. Uh, the question is, when we're talking about housing and affordable housing, most of the time we are talking about people that can't afford to live in their own city. And the, the, the 
commodification of, 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 of housing as, a, as an investment item. Not as such, like uh, Lalaina was on it about this company in London that uh, investors buy a uh, rod of houses uh, in the area and they don't even live two weeks out of a year in it. And there are uh, people that have nowhere to live. And um, I, I got so distressed now when I heard uh, Katerina uh, talking about uh, the power of these multinational companies and uh, our own handicap, that our ability to be able to stop them or to legislate over the capital, uh, I mean, it's, it's incredible. But how do you think what the shift is doing now when it comes to international agitation on, on making housing into a human right question uh, when it comes to a political will within the UN? Thank you. And uh, to Katerina, uh, you were saying that most of the times it will be very hard since the, the, the capital can go and, and, and do their own things and, and deal with each other and, 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 and create like a, a Mid Rock and then Kobe have a project and then Skanska goes there and do their own project and uh, the commune doesn't have that power. But I am thinking about since we in Malmö own one of the biggest actors in the housing market, which is Malmö Commune Bustad, Mkobe, and couldn't we try to muscle in <laughs> somehow uh, or, 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 or create a goodwill by working with uh, Mkobe in mm. creating an interest to create this affordable housing for local need. Thank yeah. you very much. Thank you very much, Abebe. Should we start with um, uh, Lailaini? You can answer. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Thanks for your questions, uh, Abebe. Um, yeah. So one of the I want to go back to the Denmark example because I think it it helps to answer your question. What was so amazing to me about what Denmark did and what the minister responsible for housing did with respect to their legislation was when they first introduced the legislation, I mean, people were calling it the Blackstone legislation colloquially because the idea was to get pushback against Blackstone from coming in. And they were very clear, they said, they made public statements, you know, saying, we believe housing is a human right. So you can, you are welcome to come in Blackstone, but you have to play by our rules. And our rules are human rights rules or human rights based rules. And I think that that's quite a, quite a big stick. And then they came up with the legislation that creates what I would call a hostile environment for an investor. And, and I think it's quite possible for states to do that. And I think that's what they should be doing. You see, if you start looking at the policy and legislative frameworks that exist, these real estate investment trusts, which is what Blackstone and others use as a way of purchasing many, many units and, and, and um, uh, getting money to secure these units. Well, there are big tax advantages in most countries for real estate investment trusts to, to establish themselves. So in most countries, they're not taxed the same way income or revenue from income is taxed. And so that's what makes it very attractive. So you can go in, real estate is a hot commodity, uh, you can make a quick return and you're not paying taxes, you see? And, and so we, we need governments to recognize the role they are playing in creating a legislative environment that is uh, um, very friendly to these actors. One thing I would put to Katrina, I, I wonder, is, is it possible for a city to approach national government and say, you know, 
you're making it very difficult for me, mayor, to ab abide by my human rights obligations under international human rights law. If you allow these actors to come in the, and create an environment that's friendly for them, then what happens is housing is becoming unaffordable in my city. And unaffordability is a violation of the right to adequate housing because under international law, it says that housing has to be affordable and affordable is based on what a household can um, bear, not what the market dictates. That's the definition of affordability under international human rights law is housing cost commensurate with household income. It's not, is housing cost commensurate with what the market can bear? And so I just wonder if that isn't, a, if you can't use human rights as your, as your stick, Katrine, as you discuss these very pertinent issues with national level government to say, do you really want a, me to be in violation of my international human rights obligations? Thanks. I think in one way, that's a little bit uh, of what signing the pledge, the shift is about. And I think we try in all different debates and different situations to have the approach of addressing the problems according to, to human rights. And I think that is a shift. And I think when I, I, I see when I talk to colleagues in different cities that more and more people, mayors included, are uh, starting to use this perspective uh, within the debates. And I, th I think that's important. I, I, one important part of the shift of signing the pledge, actually. Um, so I think that's important. But also, uh, I forgot earlier to say that when you talked about the minister, minister uh, of housing, that it's really important to address the minister of financing. Uh, <laughs> because I think some of the tools, uh, maybe most of the tools, uh, for solving this kind of issues uh, is connected to the tax uh, system and, and finance, financial uh, regulations. Um, and I think that's important to, to, to address actually when we speak with, with the national governments. Um, about the question how to use our public um, uh, housing uh, company I think it's one of our most important tool, I would say. Uh, I think I said before that when I first started out in, out in office, uh, the public housing company built 28 new housing that year, uh, that year and now they build volumes about 700 years. And I think it's important to have a strong, solid uh, housing, public housing company as an important tool. Uh, and it's important that it's, um, it's an ambitious uh, company willing to cooperate with different actors, both to build quite a lot itself, but also to drive other investment in different part of, of, of the cities. Maybe sometimes to, to start new projects before other investments are willing to, to, to start in an area. Uh, so I think it's one of our most powerful and important tools that we got at the local level. Um, at the moment, I think uh, one third of all flats for rent in Malmö is public uh, owned and we do have a policy to to strengthen uh, the company okay uh, yeah uh, now we only have a couple of minutes uh, left uh, then we we're supposed to end but uh, we have uh, some more questions and uh, we have one person Johanna Saunders who have been raising her hand. So I think we, we will let her to ask her question. And then, uh, then it would be nice to hear something, a conclusion from our guests. And then we, we can stay here in this meeting, uh, but we will uh, end the broadcast. So please, Johanna, 
Thank you. Uh, I'm uh, from the Swedish uh, Red Cross. Um, and I live and uh, work here in Malmö, but they also have a national focus. Uh, my question, I mean, the talk so far has been mostly about uh, uh, the long-term work and uh, how we can create uh, sustainability uh, in, a, in a longer perspective. And I understand that that is, of course, the main focus uh, with the shift. But I would like to address uh, how we treat people who are in a situation of homelessness here and now. Uh, and I would like to ask the perspective from um, Lailani and, and the shift, how, uh, what recommendations and, and how uh, we should meet uh, people who are vulnerable. Uh, we also have, um, for example, undocumented migrants, migrants from Europe. I mean, if we have uh, signed something that confirms that housing is a human rights and human rights are universal uh, for all people, of course. So I would like, uh, I mean, we have a big challenge in Malmö when it comes to homelessness and people sleeping rough. Um, and I think the, the direction that the social service uh, has been taking the last year in, um, in addressing and providing support uh, has been problematic when it comes to dividing uh, people in structural homelessness and people in social homelessness and what kind of uh, support they can get from the social service. Uh, so I would just like to hear from Leilani uh, what, what the recommendations uh, according to, to the shift and, and so how, how should we uh, address and give support to people in, in uh, homelessness? Yeah, and I, I can't speak specifically to the situation in Malmo because I don't I don't know it, but um, I'll, I will tell you, uh, under international human rights law, of course, homelessness is a what we call a prima facie violation of the right to housing. So it means um, uh, you don't need any more evidence than homelessness to know the the the. the housing, the right to housing has been violated, period. And that means, in other words, that different levels of government haven't effectively implemented the right to housing for that population. It's obvious because they're living rough. So it, it's just, a, it's a fact. And there's no wiggle room there. It's, there's no way to get around that. It is absolutely a violation of human rights. And we know why. And COVID tells us more than ever why because homelessness is obviously a matter of um, well it, it's, it can be a potential death sentence uh, we know that um, the health of people living in homelessness is terrible uh, we know their life expectancy is much lower and all these things so um, so then the question becomes well what are what is the expectation of cities and I have I, I actually wrote a, a re thematic report when I was rapporteur on what uh, all levels of government should do with respect to homelessness, there is an obligation to act immediately. So under international law, some things it's understood will take a long time. And, and as you said, you know, can happen progressively. And some things have to happen immediately and addressing homelessness is one of those things because of the gravity of the situation. Um, these days, I think it's well understood that what we call the housing first approach is, is really the only uh, reasonable approach. And that's an approach that provides housing to people regardless of any addictions they might have or um, any other um, um, uh, personal situation that makes it uh, difficult for them to get by on a day-to-day -day basis. None of that matters. You have to get them into a home and then provide them with the social supports necessary and any medical supports that they need. Um, there is also an understanding in, under international human rights law that your, your status or your migrant status doesn't, is not determinative, determinative of whether you should be able to enjoy the human right to housing. And so um, it has to be provided to, to you regardless of uh, your migrant status. And that, of course, can be quite complicated in the European context, and I am sensitive and was sensitive to that as rapporteur, um, because if, you're, if you have a huge influx of migrants, um, that can put a lot of stress on a housing market and, so, uh, and housing stock. 
And so you do have to figure out how you're going to deal with that with the with the migrant population. Um, obviously, you can't do things that would be perceived as discriminatory because that too is a violation of domestic and international law. So, um, so you know, none of what I said is is prescriptive. I mean, I'm not. It doesn't say, you know, it it international human rights law has to apply in every context. And so it only says you have to deal with homelessness seriously and immediately. And, and the way that you're going to do that has to be through the provision of adequate, some kind of adequate housing. Um, I think these days we understand that in some migrant situations, what, what you're going to end up with is kind of ba really like basic adequate housing, but still it has to be adequate. Um, um, so you end up with slightly two tiered um, housing. I understand that. Um, the idea is that over time that would rectify itself. So um, over time, uh, some migrants will return home to what, what they perceive as their home and some migrants will assimilate and stay. And then at that point, they need to be part of your general housing system. Okay. Thank you very much for the, the question and also for the, the answer. Uh, we have a couple of persons who have raised their hands, but we have to end the, the broadcasting now. And I would like to, uh, but you can stay and maybe you can have asking the questions later or we can yeah, fix it later. But I would like Lailena and Katrine, could you please um, make some conclusion? Is there hope? Will we fix this together? And uh, yeah, let's start with uh, Katrine. You could say something short. Thanks. Of course, uh, there's hope, and I'm I'm really convinced that if lots of people uh, get united and drive these kind of issues, uh, I know that we can make a change. I know it for sure. We have done it before, and I think uh, the work that uh, have been uh, that uh, Lailani have been doing the last couple of years uh, has made a change in, in, in one way already and I feel a difference when I first started to, to address this kind of issues and the way we address it now. Uh, you can see it in different cities, in different nations, uh, both on the local and the national level. I know for sure that we can make a change uh, and I know for sure that we will have to make a change uh, because because this is not sustainable. Uh, I think it's not an option to, to, to do nothing. Uh, and uh, well, you have a lot of different parts and, and uh, that we have to, to take actions uh, in. And I know for sure that we can make a, a change and I, uh, hope to be able to, to discuss more maybe with you, Lailani, uh, to, when we prepare this global congress in Malmö next year. I really would like uh, some strong commitment from local, uh, local leaders. And then I look forward to, to work with lots of different actors on the globe, uh, local level to uh, create better living conditions uh, for all citizens in Malmö, but also to, to make pressure on our national uh, government to make a change because lots of questions according to legislation and the tax system um, we have to have a new more social uh, policy when it comes to to housing uh, for sure yes okay Thank you so much, uh, Leilani Farha and Katrin schanfeld jamme for participating. And I want to thank you all uh, those who participated and listened today. I want to thank all of you who asked questions. And uh, I realize we haven't been able to answer all of you, the questions, but I think that we have to just go on with this work. Like you said, Katrin, uh, the Social Democratic Association in Malmö, Triangen, our local association, we have been working with house, the housing issue now th this whole year. And I think we will continue and also to work together with all 
associations and people that are interested and think that this, this is um, a very important issue. I would also like to thank uh, the Social Democrats of Malmö and the RBF, the Workers uh, Educational Association, for hosting this event. Yeah, thank you so much. It was uh, very nice to be in conversation. Thank you so much, Katrine, as well. Thank you very much, um, everyone, uh, attending this meeting. And uh, I hope to see you uh, all again soon. And maybe be able to ask, uh, uh, to answer some more uh, questions some other time. Uh, might be the first, we, or might follow some more meetings where we can have some uh, following up on, on, on some of the questions. Yes. So thank you very much. Uh, Leilani, would you just uh, end with a couple of words to summarize? <laughs> I forgot, please. Uh, oh, no, I don't need to summarize. I actually, sadly, have another call to go to because in Canada, it's only two in the afternoon. Yes. Uh, but I will say, if you're interested, anyone on the call in The Shift, you can go to maketheshift.org, maketheshift.org, and you'll find out more about us there. Um, and just on the issue of hope, uh, of course, I have hope, but it's also uh, the right to housing is a human rights obligation. And so um, governments have these obligations. So we just make sure that governments remain accountable. And uh, we have no choice, I think, but to keep keep on the work. And I think COVID has exposed that in globally, how important this work really is. So thank you. Yeah, and thank you very much, all of you, all the participants and all our guests. Uh, we from the Triangle Association, we will continue to have Zoom meetings like this. And if you are interested in politi uh, politician uh, issues, you could be a member in the Social Democratic Party. That would be great. So thank you very much. And uh, yeah, what do you say, Helena? Yeah. Thank you, and to just come please and join us. You are thank so you, welcome. Thank yeah. You. Thank you. Thank you. You're also much. Fredrik Garten. Okay. All right. Bye. Everyone. Bye. Take care. Tack, Matthias. Tack, Nina. Tack så mycket.